Latina Voices is proudly sponsored by United Airlines, the official airline of Latina Voices Smart Talk. Goya Foods, when it's Goya, it's got to be good. And Fiesta Mart, serving you since 1972. We are back with more Smart Time, and today, ladies, we see how millions of college students are being influenced by social media. How is social media, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, changing the way people communicate? Yes, what is social media's impact on today's young people and the world? Its importance. Let's take a look at Mary Grace Anderson's Eye Report. Hi, my name is Mary Grace Anderson, and in this edition of Latina Voices Smart Talk, I asked a few college students about the role of social media, how it's changed, its impact on our daily lives, and what importance it may have in the future. How important would you say social media is in your life? I believe it's um, relative to each person. Uh, in some way, I believe um, Facebook helps me to connect with my friends who are in Korea, whereas, you know, it was something that was just not possible like a decade ago. Do you feel like Social media allows you to maybe make another version of yourself, like you would no normally present yourself in a certain way. Like, have you ever been surprised, like when you actually met the person? Yes, MySpace. When MySpace came out, we were a bit younger. And MySpace mm. came out and we were in mm. like middle school. And that was when everybody was trying to establish their identity, make themselves different, at least where I grew up. And impress others. Oh man, everything was on MySpace. People would try to like, get into the clique they wanted, you know, by the style of their profile, you know, and they would just try to say statements about themselves by their profiles. So what's your decision? What makes you decide to friend somebody? I have to have met Mutual them. Mutual friends. Mm -hmm. I have to have met them, yeah. And then on top of having met them is, um, do I want this person to see my life, pretty much. Once you're friends with that person, like maybe you don't know them as well, on Facebook, like once you're friends with them, does that motivate you to be friends with them, like actual friends? No, not really. Surprisingly, <laughs> no. How would you feel if you got disconnected from, you know, your Facebook or your Twitter? I've never really used it and survived forever without it. I only got it a couple years ago and I rarely ever use it. It's just not a big part of my life. So how do you feel like, do you feel like your communication is better with people, like the fact that you have more not that you'd have more face-to-face -face interaction, but, like, but the fact that you have like less social media interaction. I, mean, I think I think it depends on the extent. Sorry, the extent you go to. If you only ever use social media, that's definitely a problem. But I think if you kind of it is no longer just the Facebook entry to connect with your high school. It's how do you utilize it as the networking tool it's how to stay you, connected. It's how you build a brand. Because, exactly. you know, that's years how I'm ago, using it. it was a one-way street. Oh, we got to go. We got to go. Let's go. We'd love to talk more about it. More when we come back. Don't go away. Today's programming on Houston PBS, made possible in part by... Pink Ribbons Project is back with Pink at the Brown. Everything's pink at the Wortham Center Brown Theater, May 10th at 8 p.m. A performance gala benefiting breast cancer through the arts, celebrating the Wortham's 25th anniversary. Performances by Alley Theater, Da Camera of Houston, Houston Ballet, Houston Grand Opera, Houston Symphony, the Society for the Performing Arts, and Stages Repertory Theater, all on one stage for one night only. Information at pinkribbons.org. a contribution to Houston PBS, you help us touch more lives in the Houston area than any other nonprofit. You are helping children learn to read. You are educating people about vital issues. You are providing world-class arts and entertainment for people who would otherwise miss the opportunity. Your donation is enriching people's lives and adding to the fabric of our community. To become a member and to learn more about where your money goes, visit HoustonPBS.org slash impact. Visit HoustonPBS.org and click on TV schedules when you need to find information on programming and the different broadcast services we offer at Houston PBS. 
Tune in Sunday afternoons for the Houston PBS Power Block. Start at 3.30 with BioCentury This Week. Followed at 4 by Platts Energy Week. Then at 4.30, it's This Week in Defense News. Watch the Power Block Sunday afternoons on Houston PBS. It drives our modern society to the point where we'd be lost without it. Power. It began with harnessing the wind, making Holland a 17th century superpower. Ever more ingenious ways to generate power would emerge through the centuries. Journalist Dr. Michael Mosley continues his journey through science to ask, can we have unlimited power? Next time on the History of Science. Tonight at 7 on Houston PBS. This is KUHT TV, Channel 8, Houston PBS. Houston PBS, broadcast from the University of Houston, Houston's public tier one university. Viewer supported through the Association for Community Broadcasting. Today's programming on Houston PBS, made possible in part by School of the Woods, Houston's only Montessori college prep school. Continuous Montessori education from age two and a half through grade 12. Founded in 1962, School of the Woods is now celebrating its 50th birthday. Independent, nonprofit, and non sectarian. School of the Woods, 1321 Ward Road. Call 713 686 8811 or visit online at schoolofthewoods.org. Bullying doesn't just happen in schools, online, or the playground. It's more prevalent in the workplace than you may think. Nearly half of all Americans report they've been affected by workplace bullying. Find out what you can do to deal with bullies in the workplace, next on Living Smart. Hello, I'm Patricia Gross. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Craig Clayton Sr. often speaks about diversity, leadership, and management. He's been the director and diversity strategist with the University of Houston's International Institute for Diversity and Cross-Cultural Management since 1999. Over time, one of the subjects he's chosen to tackle is workplace or corporate bullying. What do you do when someone uses either verbal, psychological, physical abuse, or humiliation to get their way? How do you handle this type of harassment? He's here to enlighten us. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And uh, Mr. Kate, I'd like to start with a definition um, always. Um, Pamela Ludgen Sandvik expands the definition of workplace bullying as follows. It is a persistent verbal and nonverbal aggression at work that includes personal attacks, social ostracism, and a multitude of other painful messages and hostile interactions. Now, in your opinion, what is the difference between workplace bullying and harassment sounds very similar. Very much so. There's are, there are some distinct differences though. Harassment in most cases is targeted towards individuals based on a category that they may represent. Women may be harassed primarily because of gender. People who speak with an accent may be harassed primarily because again of that distinction. However, when it comes to bullying, bullying can be for any number of reasons, but it's normally something the bully has found in the person they're picking on that makes them think either this person is smarter than, more attractive than, more popular than, and it's similar to some of the same reasons people are bullied in schools, only now it happens in the workplace. Now, let's look at another definition. Gary and Ruth Namey define workplace bullying as repeated, health-harming mistreatment verbal abuse or conduct which is threatening, humiliating, intimidating, or sabotage that interferes with work or some combination of the three. What are your thoughts about that? Because that's a different type of definition. Yeah, absolutely. And just as a quick side note, I personally have been bullied. So the examples that you're giving in those definitions are real. There is a physical component relative to the impact of being bullied. There also are impacts around your performance things that now will affect how you actually do your job as well. So those are absolutely perfect definitions in that context. How does someone know they're being bullied uh, or harassed? I mean, how do you know? In most cases, the person being bullied knows it. There are examples of where the person doing the bullying may not be aware of the extent to which that behavior is now being perceived. So there are some instances where the bully knows that they're clearly creating an environment that's not healthy, but they may not know it goes to that extreme. Normally the behaviors, regardless of the definition, are seen as deliberate, 
They're repeated right. in most cases, and unfortunately, the target is clearly aware that they're being picked on. So those are the three rules of definition, the deliberate, um, um, disrespectful, and repeated. Yes, ma'am. That's something that you have to be remembering when you're uh, being bullied. <laughs> yes, and that's going to be at the core of almost any definition that you'll see as well. Okay. Now, is there a fine line between being like a tough love kind of boss, uh, uh, you know, hard, you know, someone who keeps you accountable, and a bully? Great I mean, question. how do you, yeah, how do you define? And, and I'll give you the example is that in most cases, and again, I'll specifically talk about the Houston area where we've got a significant amount of oil and gas and production facilities, where in that culture, there are managers who truly do take the tough love approach to managing. Mm -hmm. However, what crosses the line is when it becomes personal. It's one thing for me to ride you every day about some nuance of your job because I don't think you're doing it well enough and giving you feedback on how to improve. Even if I'm over the top in that feedback, right. it's another when now I assail you personally around the reasons that you're not able to accomplish the task. That's where it crosses the now line. Give me an example of that. It's one thing to say, for an example, that there are skills you may be missing to effectively do the job, and I think you should have those skills, so I'm consistently kind of nudging you along, though right. not necessarily in a kind way. Right. That's helping you do your job better. Okay. But if there now is a connection to what's not being done and you're not smart enough oh, or okay. you don't have okay. the intellect to pull it off okay. and I make it personal, <clears throat> that's when it crosses the line. Okay. Are there certain tactics that corporate bullying include? When you say tactics, mm -hmm. elaborate. I'm not sure what you mean. Well, are there certain things that they use to, to, to treat you badly? Oh, absolutely. There are an array of different behaviors that constitute bullying. Mm -hmm. There's not a one-size-fits-all. There are some bullies that are micromanagers, and their whole intent is to find any possible behavior or work behavior, if you would, that you've engaged in that they can ride you on. Mm -hmm. There's others that they have a confrontational, in-your-face type demeanor, and they are literally yelling and screaming about everything that you do. There's literally a dozen or more different kinds of bullies, and sometimes you're not even aware that you're being bullied because the definition hasn't been clearly defined. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily know that that constitutes bullying until someone says, the analogy I'll use is this, uh, sexual harassment. That when organizations 10 or 15 years ago started training around what was and was not sexual harassment, people often left the workshops going, wow, I didn't know that was sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing when you start defining what is bullying. Often in the definition, someone will hear, I've been going through that. Right. And I knew it didn't feel good, but I didn't really know how to define it. How can, and we'll talk about definitions later, how can a, um, a victim ultimately be affected by, by bullying? Oh, tremendous impact. Um, every organization I know of today is trying to get more with less. And the thing they have less and less of are people. And the one thing every organization needs is for their employees to bring their A game to work every day. Mm -hmm. In most cases, when employees go through these behaviors, there is a reaction relative to the physical impact. There's a reaction relative to the performance impact. And those are things organizationally that have a direct financial impact on the organization. And there's many examples of that as well, too. Who exactly are the perpetrators of this? Bullies come in every size, shape imaginable. Uh, unfortunately, the people being bullied more often than not are women. There's a disproportionately high number of women on yeah, the receiving end of bullying. Right. It's 57% women are more likely to be bullied than men, which yes. amazes me. And the other one is that women tend to bully women, 71% of the cases. Absolutely right. right. And, and again, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people hear that and assume that the men being bullied are rare and that, too, they fit a, a visual profile, if you would, of someone who's small-framed, quiet, uh, sits mm -hmm. in a corner and looks like a target. I'm 6'5", 270 pounds, I've been bullied. And I've had that bullseye placed on me. So one, clearly women are more likely to encounter the behaviors, but men are also getting bullied on a consistent basis in the workplace too. Were you bullied in the workplace? Or were you bullied in, oh, yeah, in, in the, the military? Or in the, in the, in Absolutely in the workplace, okay. no question. What role does race play? Uh, yes. It may have some impact, but the majority of the distinguishing factors of why you are being bullied normally aren't, with some exceptions, there are exceptions to where people will pick on someone they deem to be attractive because for whatever the reasons they don't see themselves as. So as a result, they're now casting those 
challenges around how they're being perceived on you and they're trying to belittle and take away from your professionalism and how you perform in the workplace. There's an array of other factors people look at. Race is one, but it's not normally it's not the prevalent way. one, absolutely. Is there abuse? I mean, I would think that someone who bullies all the time is kind of, they have some issues, right? Personal, psychological <laughs> issues, but does, does the abuser generally know that they're bullying? Or they're <laughs> clueless? They know what they're doing. There's they only do? a few occasions that there's what we would call the unconscious incompetence in this space. The majority of bullies know that what they're doing crosses a line. Many times they don't know the degree to which it crosses because it becomes so ingrained in their behavior that they literally come to work looking for targets, if you would. And, and in many cases, let me distinguish that, they're looking for victims. Now, in this context, there's a difference between being a target and a victim. They may target you in the context of the behaviors that they exhibit. But if you allow yourself to exhibit the behaviors of being a victim, that's where learned helplessness comes in mm -hmm. and there's nothing mm -hmm. I can do about it. Right. But the first step in ending the bullying, if you're on the receiving end of it, is to frame yourself in the mindset of not being a victim, but a target. And I'm not going to allow you to put that target on me any longer and I won't be a victim. And I will, we'll talk about what are some of the things you can do to, once you start getting bullied, what, what do you do? Okay. But I want to know what drives an individual to actively participate in bullying. In, in most cases, there's a, an array of behaviors when you start to talk to them that drove what they were doing. And as I said earlier, a lot of it is clearly that they're looking to find a way to put down the person who is professionally performing at a level sometimes higher than the bully. And they don't want that person to be seen as the, the person that is, in many cases, the heir apparent. Because again, most bullies are managers bullying subordinates, not peer-to-peer. -peer. There oh, is some peer-to-peer okay. -peer bullying, but the majority of it is manager to subordinate. Now, in America today, you cannot file a lawsuit against bullying. Not unless that behavior also crosses the line of potentially involving someone in what HR refers to as the protected categories. So if you are a woman, a minority, someone that has a physical limitation of some sort, and you are being bullied, and your perception is the reason you're being bullied is because of that category that you're in, then there is unquestionably an opportunity to sue. But at the present, there's no law in any state in the U.S. against bullying, though there's 20 plus states that have what are called healthy workplace bills oh. pending that will outlaw the bullying behaviors. But as you can imagine, there's an array of lobbyists trying to prevent it from getting passed. What, I, I would think that businesses would care about this because it affects the bottom line. Can you share with me how it affects the bottom line to have bullies in the workplace? Absolutely. I'll give you an example. Um, one organization we did an assessment for that had 5,000 employees. In this case, we found over 75% of their employees had encountered bullying behaviors in the last 12 months. On average, four incidents per year. We then just asked a series of very logical questions. If you've encountered this, have you lost productive time at work, avoiding the person or worrying about the person who committed the behavior? What we found is that on average, five hours of lost productivity were cited by the individual, either avoiding or worrying about the person per incident. So you can do the math pretty quickly. If you've got an average of four incidents occurring and you're losing five hours per incident, that's 20 hours of lost productivity. And 75% of the employees in this organization of 5,000 people have stated they're losing that amount of productivity. For most executives that I've met with, when we come to them and say, here's what the data shows, X percent of your people have encountered this, you get the denial. I can't believe we've got that happening. But when you can connect it to now taking compensation and driving what's being lost relative to lost productivity connected to that and say, and you're losing $200 million a year in lost <laughs> that's, productivity. That's when they perk up. They, they oh, want to stop I gotta it. Listen exactly now. right. <laughs> Even though in many cases they're the perpetrator of some of those same bullying exactly, behaviors. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about types of bullies because I, th I found this very interesting. The gatekeeper. Those are the folks that are the ones that assume every employee is stealing. <laughs> and what they assume you're stealing is time. And okay. those are the folks that literally, if you've got a 15 minute break and you're gone for 16, they're pulling you over to their desk to say, what took you so long <laughs> oh, on your break? God. But that's also the same manager that knows you come in a half hour early, right, right, leave a half hour late, right. and work through your lunch, but they never come over and say, get up from here and go stretch your legs and get out of here for a while. Right. 
Constant critic. This is very common, I think, right? I worked for one of those as well. Right. There's nothing you can do that's right. The way you speak is wrong. The way you dress is wrong. The way your hair looks, not that I have to challenge anymore, <laughs> is wrong. But they're not satisfied with anything, and they are indeed a critic over everything that you do. The screamers. Now, these are not so acceptable, are they? Well, you'd be surprised how many times it becomes acceptable depending on who the screamer is. I'll give you an example. Here in Houston, I worked with a company in the petrochemical business. Uh, they had one facet of the business that was doing a lot of R&D work, and they had an individual there with multiple PhDs who owned multiple patents that the organization now was reaping financial rewards from. Mm -hmm. He was also unquestionably a screamer, and everyone knew it. And they turned a blind eye and deaf ear to his behavior because of the value they perceived him to bring. Only no one would work with this man. So after a while, it became nobody's untouchable when they realized people were leaving, including other scientists who just didn't want to work with this person any longer. Oh, boy. Did, did, did that ever stop or he continued screaming? It did stop <laughs> okay. once the CEO realized what was happening because it had been kept cocooned in R&D. But when it got back to the CEO that the perception was this person was untouchable to the extent of an individual that can take control, mm -hmm. the CEO got out of his chair, went over to the R&D part of the organization in another building, called a meeting and said, no one in this building is untouchable, including me. And this stops today. And so if did? you think you're untouchable, come see me and we'll help you put a resume together. It stopped. It stopped. It stopped. You stopped screaming. Two-headed snake, what is that about? <laughs> Those are the folks who say one thing to you, but say something to someone else. And they will make you feel as though they are supportive of your efforts, but in actuality, every opportunity they get, they're tearing down what you do, how you do it, and attempting to pull the rug out from under your feet. Oh, boy. Snoop. The snoop. <laughs> I, I can think of the individual that comes to mind with an organization in particular. Again, I go back to the production environment, where in this particular setting, this manager would literally spend half of his day watching his employees work from a position that they couldn't see him watching them. Mm -hmm. And his whole outlook was to see, what are you doing? Are you wasting time? Are you not doing something you should? <laughs> would call you into his office and ask you, why did you spend 15 minutes out at building two at 10 o'clock this morning? Oh, well, how do you know I was at building two at 10 o'clock? Well, he was peeking around the corner right, taking right. notes. I mean, a snoop. That's snoop, exactly. <laughs> the ringmaster. Those are the folks literally that want you to jump through hoops. And they consistently are, in most cases, moving the target. And even if you jump through the hoop and succeed, their outlook on it is, you must have gotten lucky, so I'm going to hold the hoop up again and challenge you to jump another time to see, can you do it again, even though you've already proven that you can. Oh, boy. Manipulator. Wow, there's a lot of those out there, unfortunately. Those are the ones that literally will try to find every opportunity they can to take either a project, assignment, or opportunity create a scenario where you can't succeed, and then we'll cite back to you the reason for your failure wasn't the scenario, it was your inability to accomplish the task. Mm -hmm. Queen syndrome. Ah, the queen bee. That's one that I've gotten into some heated discussions in some organizations <laughs> about because I bet. Uh, the queen bee is by default normally a woman in a senior management position who often deems other women in the organization to be in need of help, but her perception on it is, I got here without help, why should I worry about helping someone else? Mm -hmm. So as a result, they normally are more confrontational to other women and try to find ways, if at all possible, to belittle them because it unfortunately makes them look good. Now, how does bullying affect health? Oh, tremendously. I mean, when I was going through the bullying myself, I could unquestionably tell blood pressure issues were occurring. There were issues that were connected to frustration, anger, short-temperedness. I'd go home as a result of being bullied in the workplace and would now respond to my beautiful bride in ways that were clearly inappropriate, but I didn't realize the connection between what I had experienced at work that I was now coming home and taking it out on other people. And you told me about a story about a woman. Oh, yeah. Um, there was a lady in particular who, um, brilliant, I'm talking geophysicist, um, multiple degrees, in her environment, she worked for a bully that was so confrontational in his management style that her words to me were, I come in two hours early and leave two hours late every day just to make sure I can do every possible thing he might want to avoid him having any reason to come to my desk. Her words were, when I hear his voice coming down the hall in my direction, 
I get physically ill to the point that rarely does a day pass that I don't have to pull my trash can out from under my desk to throw up into my trash can when I hear him walking down the hall in my direction. That's no way to live that every extreme. day. That extreme. Absolutely. I hope she's not working there anymore. Unfortunately, <laughs> she still is, and so is the bully. Oh, boy. So we, we need to talk about how to deal with that. Yes. Is micromanagement a form of bullying? Oh, absolutely. Why? Um, that person that is the gatekeeper, the one that is meticulously watching every conceivable detail to find anything they can to assail you is micromanaging. And in its essence, when you look at what the definition of micromanagement is, it's normally those people who will take every opportunity they can to manage every piece of what you touch and do, normally not because they don't think you can do the work, but they want to make sure that if you do it differently than they do, they have a reason now to call you on it. Mm. Let's talk about disarming a bully. What do we do to deal with this? How do you disarm a bully? There's two parts to that. Um, firstly, there's the how do you disarm it if you're the individual being bullied. But to me, there's a bigger picture coming up out of the weeds around what do organizations do to eliminate this environment that allows the bully to thrive. Firstly, on an individual level, the first thing you have to do is to take control. Because in most cases, the bullies aren't picking on you because of some profile that you have. Bullies will pick on people who they find they can bully. And if they get away with it when they begin the behaviors, they'll continue it. So the first thing is to take control back, to let the bully know that those behaviors will stop, that the context of what it feels like is uncomfortable. Because for me to tell you that I feel uncomfortable when you say or do something, I don't need your permission to tell you I feel uncomfortable. Now you've defined what's acceptable and not acceptable from a behavioral standpoint. You also have to give the bullies some options. To say to that person, when you called me out in the meeting because you didn't like a suggestion that I gave and referenced it as, how stupid is that? Firstly, I felt embarrassed when you said that. Again, I don't need your permission to tell you I felt embarrassed. But then there should be an option given that if you really felt that uncomfortable with something I had suggested in the meeting, one, to assail the idea as it's, from your perception at least, not valid is one thing, but to make it personal now crosses the line. I have no problem with your assailing an idea I bring up, but in the future I prefer that you not take the personal attack in the context of how you're framing it. Now you've given them other options. And lastly in that context, once you've done that, frame it as politely as you can, I've got another meeting to go to and politely leave. Now, there are proven processes that you can use, too, because everything you've said is verbal. Yes. It is not written, and it is not documented. The That's person right. can say, I never, you never told me this. I never knew this. So how do you, what's a proven process to deal with this? Great question. Two things. One, rarely does bullying only happen in private. In most instances, bullies will exhibit those behaviors in the presence of others. When you are on the receiving end of that bullying behavior, one, immediately note who was present. Secondly, document it. Because in any instance where you're being treated inappropriately, inappropriately in the workplace, it's to your benefit to document what's taking place. When you're on the receiving end of that behavior, take the time to, to, to take the notes around who was present, what was said, how did you respond to it, and develop, if you would, a track record that now when you do take this, after you're assuming again that it's not stopped, when you do take this to HR or someone that's appropriately tasked to resolve it, you've got a history of what's happened, not just the anecdotes that they can refute. Normally, they're not taking the time to make notes, and in most cases, the person with the notes is the one that they're going to believe. Now, if, if you're not the one being bullied, but you notice that your coworkers or someone that you care for, or even you don't care for, is being bullied, what can you do? One, if you don't find your voice, what you're defining relative to observing those behaviors is a term we call collusion. And you can collude with people in many ways, but the normal method of colluding is silence. I heard something that was said. I knew it was inappropriate, but I chose not to speak up. The reality is, if you don't speak up today, the first thing we try to get people to understand is that that bully can turn that target on you tomorrow. And if you're not finding your voice today, how can you expect others to find their voice when you're on the receiving end of the behaviors? And clearly there's multiple examples of where, even from a historical standpoint, that's occurred and caused problems societally. I shared this in a meeting the other day that I really thought was appropriate because the comment came up about collusion and is it really that big a deal? Mm. The example that I gave 
was going back to the height of Nazi Germany. And it's mm -hmm. a quote from Reverend Niemuller, who was referencing the fact that there were clearly issues relative to how the Nazis were handling people's religious beliefs that people took, at least in most cases, the perception of they're not talking to me so I left it alone. The quote was this, first they came for the Catholics and I didn't speak up because I wasn't Catholic. Then they came for the Protestants and I didn't speak up because I wasn't Protestant. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak up because I wasn't Jewish. Then they came for me, only there was nobody left to speak up. So if you don't find your voice when you see someone else is on the receiving end of it, keep getting up because it, eventually that target's going to turn to you. When you see it, you need to say something when it occurs and make sure someone in a position of authority knows, here's what just took place. I made sure they knew that was unacceptable, but somebody needs to take the time to have a conversation with them. Tell me what are the three things that you would like for people to take away from this, uh, three most important things um, that you'd like our viewers to take away from this? Well put. It depends on the role you're in. If you're in an organization and have any degree of decision making or authority in that organization, take ownership. Because these behaviors are not happening in a vacuum, they're happening in every organization, for profit, not for profit, public, private, doesn't matter. Two, if you're on the receiving end of these behaviors, don't assume that you've done anything to deserve it. Because often the perception of people being bullied is very similar to those that are in spousal abuse environments, mm. where the person that is laying hands on someone in that environment makes the person feel as though they're basically nothing, that you deserve to be treated this way. You should be grateful that I even allow you to come to this house. And people buy into that. In the workplace, when you get bullied consistently, often people wonder, is it something about me? I must not be doing my job right. I deserve to be treated this way. If there were anything, as opposed to the three points, the most significant point for me would be if you're being bullied, one, know that you've done nothing to deserve it, and two, find your voice. How do you know you're living smart? You have a short time. Sure, when you're making a difference. Because at the end of the day, that's what I'm trying to do is make a difference. And you are making a difference. Mr. Clayton, thank you so much for joining us. We thank really you. appreciate it. My pleasure. And to learn more about dealing with workplace bullies, go to our website. There you'll find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments at 713-743-8513. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a peaceful week. For a transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest. Today's programming on Houston PBS, made possible in part by Pink Ribbons Project.